Look, the political challenge uh, of climate change in the United States is relatively easy to diagnose. The latest data suggests that in the last election, more than 50% of voters in every county in the United States supported putting limits on carbon pollution coming out of existing coal-fired power plants. So in every district, red district, blue districts, or, not, districts or otherwise, actions that were at the core of the Obama climate agenda are popular. More than 50% of people support them. On the other hand, when you ask, where does climate change rank among the priorities that are most important to you? Jobs, economic security, national security, otherwise. Climate consistently ranks outside of the top five. So it's a popular issue, but it's a low intensity issue. So the question is, how do you overcome that? And increasingly, the answer is connecting this to local issues that affect people in their lives today. So if you look at places that are increasingly affected in real terms by climate issues, pockets of the American West where wildfires have now uh, encroached upon people's uh, communities in an annual way that they can't avoid, parts of the eastern seaboard where you're seeing these sunny day floods, where the water is seeping up through Miami Beach, for example, uh, when, uh, when you get to high tide. Those are places where people are starting to real realize and recognize the impact in their day-to-day -day life. And part of what's incumbent on people who work on this issue is to find ways to connect climate change and meet people where they are. Because it is a challenging issue to say, global average temperatures are rising by a degree. Well, that doesn't mean anything to anybody in their life. It's hard to take that home and stack that up against, how am I gonna meet my next uh, health insurance payment? But if you can find ways to connect it uh, into people's lives in very practical terms, this is what it's going to mean for uh, your job. This is what it's gonna mean for the community that you live in, for the insurance rates that you're gonna have to pay uh, for your home, for the risk to the air that your kids breathe when you put them on the bus to go to school in the morning. Those are issues that capture people and capture uh, them to activism and capture them to uh, care about and prioritize those issues at the ballot box. So it's an undone project, but one where the path is clearer now than it has been in the past. Well, I have a four-year-old daughter, and so we're just beginning that process. But I think it comes back to the basics of the way that you try to connect this issue to anyone, which is she already understands the importance of having clean air, having clean water, and taking responsibility for the environment that you operate in. And that if you are kind and you are conscientious, then you are going to leave the world in a better place for those who come after you. And it's, it is striking that typical people, whether they're in the United States or elsewhere, whether they're young, old, otherwise, connect to the local environment with which, within which they live. People are passionate about the local air quality and the local water quality because they're worried about their own lives and livelihoods, but because they also feel they have a stake in them. So making those connections between the very localized impacts and the global nature of this problem is, the, is at the heart of the challenge. I think those who care about climate change knew, need to do a better job of figuring out how to localize these issues and meet people where they are. If you look at the Paris Agreement, you have to understand that it's not just the words on the page. It's the movement that not just countries diplomatically, but businesses and NGOs and others contributed to. And if you look at the momentum behind that movement, what's clear is that the Trump administration, nor any uh, particular political party leading any particular country right now, is capable, no, no administration is capable of canceling Paris, and canceling the momentum behind it. Technically, the agreement is entered into force. Uh, that happened last year, months, uh, years quicker than people thought anticipated. And so for the United States to pull back uh, from that, there's a technical process that we need to go through. But more generally, the biggest, the irony of this is that the biggest loser, if the United States steps away from the negotiating table here is the United States. 
The countries of the world have already made clear the direction they're intending to go. More than 130 countries have ratified the Paris Agreement. Every major economy has reaffirmed its commitment to the Paris Agreement since the election in the United States in November. Countries with their own tumultuous political processes have come through that saying, we're committed to this. Take the uh, UK and the Brexit as an example. So we know where the world is going. The principal risk, if the United States backs away, is that that's a negotiating table where other countries are going to seek opportunities. Opportunities to partner on new clean energy technologies, opportunities to deploy the kind of financing in the Green Climate Fund and otherwise, to try to, uh, to, uh, to deploy the most innovative, scalable technologies in their own countries. And if the United States isn't part of that conversation, then U.S. industries will be put at a competitive disadvantage. There's no question about that. Having sat at that negotiating table uh, for several years, other countries are looking opportunistically for opportunities. And part of what the goal, part of what the job of the United States delegation is, is to sit there and protect U.S. interests. So if the United States backs away, that conversation is going to keep going. That table is going to keep happening. That train has left the station. The risks for the United States are real in that context. And so uh, I hope as a, as a citizen and as somebody who recognized the jobs and the economic opportunity that could come from clean energy in the future, that we don't end up in that situation. The last thing I would say, and this is important in the international context too, is that the clean energy opportunities run across the technology uh, standpoint. Some of the most exciting opportunities in the future are around partnering on things like uh, carbon capture and sequestration technology. If you look at what the long-term future for coal is internationally as well as in the United States, it's around breakthroughs in carbon capture technology that allows you to capture the emissions so you can continue to uh, produce energy and electricity from coal. Same is true for nuclear technology. There's going to be a big push to install more nuclear technology in places like China and India. The United States has a choice. They can, their businesses can be part of those export opportunities and they can be part of setting safety standards to try to help ensure that these things are done in the right way, or we can back away from the table. Those conversations can continue without us. Our businesses can be handicapped, and we will have less of a hand in what happens. Well, look, I think the, uh, the, the people who are living issues in the here and now are usually the worst at projecting what historians will say about it in the future. So I will uh, uh, start with an upfront, quite a bit of dose of humility about um, what uh, historians will say. What I hope they say is they look back at this period in the uh, period of the country and the world, and they see this as the turning point when the global community for the first time in a serious and durable way, took seriously the issue of climate change and resolved to try to start to solve it. The actions to date aren't anywhere close to what's gonna be necessary to solve this issue. And obviously, as the political change in the United States suggests, this is not going to move in a straight line. But I think if you look at what's happened over the last several years, the momentum toward addressing climate change is irreversible, and there's something different about that than has ever happened before. That's embodied in the Paris Agreement, but it's much bigger than the Paris Agreement. So my hope is that you look back several generations and say, they didn't get it right. They weren't moving fast enough. They weren't as aggressive as they should have been. But for the first time, that was a turning point where you started to see the global community put the priority on this issue that it deserved.